Greetings, folks. We're getting awfully close to Christmas time here. So this is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and I'm going to read some scripture for you. I have a, a, a reading for Advent for you. Moli Wasi is going to come and uh, uh, sing a song for us. I'll have a brief sermon for you, and uh, we'll be setting the stage for this uh, Christmas week. We'll be setting the stage for Christmas Eve, and so I hope that you will uh, that you'll enjoy this tonight, this week. I would like to read from 2 Samuel, from the Old Testament, chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, and then also verse 16. I have to find my place here. I practiced this, I really did. Now when the king dwelt in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all the enemies around about, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I will dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of the God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel out of Egypt to this day, but I have been moving with them in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word about having you know, the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people say, Why have you not built me a house? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from the fellow uh, following the sheep, that you should be the prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they will may dwell in their own place, and be distributed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From that time I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares that to you that the Lord will make you a great house. And verse 16, And your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord for his faithful people. But that's the Old Testament. Let's see what the New Testament might have for us today coming out of Luke. Chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So perk up. This is really exciting. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph to, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at his saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have been found, God has found favor with you, Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will visit you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And she is in the sixth month with her son, 
uh, who, who once we called barren. For with God all things are possible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel then departed her. Again, the word of the Lord for his most faithful people. We live on the brink every day. We stand on the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and the divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often we forget to look up and see the angels in our living rooms. We forget that the love we give and live is a sign of eternity. God with us right now in this moment. We forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's favor came to a girl. Must have been a wonderful girl. It might have been your daughter. It could have been a girl down the street. A grandchild. But the messenger of God came and greeted her and said, The Lord is with you. With a gift and a promise, Emmanuel, God is with us. We light these candles tonight with peace in our hearts for the promise of proximity, closeness to God. Even when we forget to listen, to lean into his presence, God is as close as our own breath. This in a confused and confusing world is a peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that knows that company is indeed coming soon. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
I return. And I'll be brief. So you can hang around, okay? This won't take long. But you might like what you hear. So Gabriel visits Mary. Earlier, Gabriel had visited Zechariah, John's dad, John the Baptist. And there are many similarities in these visits, but there are differences as well. So let's recall, let me set this over here. Similarities and differences. Both visits open with the announcement of a child, a special child to be born. Gabriel tells Zechariah that this child will prepare the people for the arrival of the Lord. Gabriel tells Mary that her child is the Lord. These revelations are consistent with angelic visits in the Old Testament. The angel says, kind of, hey, calm down. There's nothing to be afraid of. I'm just a messenger. The angel calls the person by name, Zechariah, Mary. Gabriel tells Zechariah that his prayer has been answered. And he tells Mary that she is favored. Gabriel announces the birth of the children and even names them, John and Jesus. And then the angels describe their purpose, their role, their ministry. Both Zechariah and Mary follow all of that up with a question. God makes announcements in our lives, and we may have questions as well. Sometimes the announcement comes as an answer to prayer, as with the case of Zechariah, a long sought after prayer. Sometimes the announcement prompts us to say, like a surprise, like Mary, I didn't see this coming at all. But as we investigate this scripture this morning, may we each embrace the fact that God makes promises. And our response to those promises says an awful lot about what we think about God. It may be true that our lack of faith, you know, can inhibit great works, but I don't think God places us in the middle of work and just kind of leaves us stranded there. Sometimes in our lives we seek a fulfillment that reaches to the level of Zechariah and Elizabeth, a child in the old age there. And I'm not suggesting that if you're 80s or 90s or something that, you know, that's going to happen. But you may be in your 80s and your 90s and there's a, a, a family member that you just can't, you know, reconcile with or forgive or be forgiven by. Miracles that can happen is what's being said here. And so keep praying and looking for that. Nothing is impossible with God for sure. Gabriel gives Mary an answer to her question. Now Gabriel has been around for quite some time, all right? He assisted Daniel in the Old Testament, uh, Daniel chapter 8. When I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. So Gabriel, he's been around a few decades, we'll say. Of course, Michael makes an appearance in Daniel as well, but, uh, and he shows up in Revelation, but uh, we'll get into Michael at some other time. The book of Daniel, familiar to the Hebrew people, mentioned in the New Testament, I think it is not an accident that Gabriel is involved in this more than human event that is taking place. They need to know that Jesus is not some anomaly in the midst of Roman occupation. Luke does not reference Roman history or Roman gods. Luke references the angels that the Hebrew people are familiar with from their scripture. Yet Mary was greatly troubled. Immediately the angel reassures Mary with the all-important promise that she had found favor with God. She was going to have a baby, and he would be the son of God. And she, he t Gabriel told uh, Mary that the name of the baby was going to be Jesus. How was it that Mary found favor with God? The scripture doesn't tell us. Why would God choose a humble, non-royal, bottom of the social class simple girl to give birth to the hope 
of mankind. And you have this best gift, the last chance, the most precious commodity in the history of all of reality, and has given, you know, Mary's got like no resources to take care of that. We often feel like Mary. When the Holy makes contact with us, we feel a bit overwhelmed. We feel a bit undeserving. Like Mary, we need to be reassured that God looks upon us with favor. How can this be? For we know that it is totally impossible, on our own anyway. Yes, Mary asks the question, and the angel gives her the answer. The same answer your angel gives you when you think things are impossible. The Holy Spirit will visit you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This is the answer Gabriel gives Mary. Mary trusts and Mary believes. True enough, Mary's job might have been a bit more sensational than anything I've done. Gabriel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. He goes on to describe the ministry of Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of David, and his reign will never end. His kingdom will never end. Here again, Luke and Gabriel do some name dropping. David, Mary's son, will have the throne of King David. It's as if Gabriel is going out of his way to make sure that we all know who Jesus is. This is an important reassurance for Mary and for all of us. Mary has been chosen, favored by God. Today, many assume that those who God favors will enjoy some really great and wonderful things like a continental, a Lincoln Continental or a mansion or, or something like that. But it doesn't appear to be that way. The people that God seems to favor are people like Mary, people that are just obedient like Mary that says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be with me as you have said. And so we have the Holy Spirit, whereas in the Mary's day, and yeah, we may have angels looking out for us, but in a sense, we kind of have something better. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells with us, that does pretty much the same thing as the angels. I am convinced that the degree to which God's promises can be made fullest in your life depends upon what you think of God and what you think of Jesus. They think an awful lot of you and your response to that, your degree of saying to God, I am your servant, may it be with me, as you have said, the more convinced you are of that, the more committed you are of that, the more blessing that you can receive. Not wealth, not fame, not things like that, but meaningfulness, something in your life that is truly, genuinely important and can carry on throughout generations. Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Our Lord, as we come upon this Christmas season, as our days are getting shorter in terms of, of daylight, but closer in terms of our celebration of the birth of Jesus, reinstill within us the fact, the reassurance that we indeed are favored by you because you love us, that we are favored because you have given us the Holy Spirit, that we are favored because you have given us purpose. Lord, make that purpose live and make that purpose effective in our lives and in the life and, and, and to the benefit of all of mankind who you would like to bring to your name and your salvation. We pray that in your precious name. Amen.